welcome. This is our third study on an introduction to Revelation, and uh, I realize this has been a lengthy introduction, and we'll have another introduction as well next week. Uh, last week, we talked about the theories of interpretation, and we talked about the four theories that there are actually categories of interpretation, because within these categories are many differences of opinion. Uh, one category is the futurist category, and uh, the modern evangelical viewpoint is in this futurist category. I would say the modern evangelical televangelist uh, uh, perspective is in the futurist category. Futurists believe uh, that relative to the date that, that it was written, most of the revelation uh, concerns a short period of time in the distant future. And uh, the distant, distant future as it relates to when it was written. And um, that, of course, has been almost 2,000 years now. So I think we're right in saying the distant future. And that really we're talking about chapters 4 through 19 uh, in that ballpark. Uh, most futurists would hold that that uh, section of the Revelation refers to the distant future from the time that it was written. Uh, now, the second category, uh, another category that we talked about last time was the historicist category. Uh, this, uh, the traditional Protestant view from the 16th through the 19th centuries um, was a historicist perspective. Historicists believe most of the revelation is a prophecy that stretches from the time of writing all the way to the end of the world, the end of everything. And the events in the revelation they would hold correspond with some major events in Christian history. Uh, so they're stretching it out over the, the whole length of Christian history from the apostles' time all the way to the end. Uh, thirdly, the preterist category, preterist meaning past, uh, and this point of view has been common throughout church history. Preterists believe some or most of the revelation is a prophecy about events that took place soon after it was written in the first century. Uh, this is the view that uh, I will present in, in our study. Uh, preterists uh, uh, hold that uh, at least the revelation from chapter 4 through chapter 19 uh, happened in the uh, near or in the first century. Then there is the spiritualist or idealist point of view. And again, this has also been common throughout church history. Spiritualists or idealists believe that most of the revelation is not intended to be interpreted as actual events but as the ongoing recurring battle between Christ and Satan and the church and the world. All right. So, and as I've said before, the uh, it's important that we remember that uh, all Orthodox Christians, whatever perspective they hold on uh, the revelation, whether it's futurist, historicist, whether it is um, preterist or spiritualist, all Orthodox Christians believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. If, if a person steps out of that uh, uh, doctrine, if they suggest that Christ has already come or uh, is not coming, uh, that person has certainly stepped out of orthodoxy. We would charge them with heresy. There's a, another couple important points that I want to emphasize each time. Good, honest, Bible-believing Christians down through the entire age of the church have held to these different approaches to the revelation. Someone is not liberal. Someone is not denying Christ. Someone is not rejecting the scripture simply because they hold another perspective than what is held by the televangelists. And also in review, the Free Methodist Church is one of those denominations that does not take an official position on uh, on the in its doctrinal statements on which interpretation uh, the church should hold. We allow pastors the freedom to study the scripture and teach uh, according to uh, how the spirit directs them. All right, those are important points for us to remember each time. We also talked about the authorship, and we considered uh, the authorship issues. 
And the best con conclusion, in my opinion, is that the early church was correct. John the Apostle is the author of the Revelation. If you want to look back or go back to my previous uh, introduction number two and consider the issue a little bit more deeply, uh, then please do that. Uh, also, we considered the timing of fulfillment of these prophecies. In Revelation 1.1, and Revelation 1.3 and Revelation 22.10 indicate the time for the fulfillment of these prophecies would be soon or near. In fact, John was told, do not seal these up because the time is near. Uh, that's an important reason why we are going to consider events of the first century as fulfilling much of the prophecy of this book. And we considered the date of writing. As I've said previously, uh, many, many scholars, probably the majority of scholars, tend to date the revelation from, uh, to, in the last decade of the first century, the 90s, 95, 96 AD, during the reign of Titus Flavius Domitian. Uh, and uh, they do that only because Irenaeus made a statement that's somewhat ambiguous that led, uh, leads many people to believe that John wrote it or saw the vision at that time. But the statement is very ambiguous, and uh, the internal evidence of the book of the Revelation, the Revelation itself, indicates that a better estimated date of writing would be in the early years of the sixth decade of the first century, uh, before the Jewish War, somewhere between 60 and 66 A.D., uh, now that's where we left off, and I, I want to now I want to finish our notes from last time by consider, considering genre in the book of Revelation. Genre in the book of the Revelation, the Revelation again of Jesus Christ, not Revelations, not Revelations plural, not the Revelation of the future, not the Revelation of John, but the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's uh, read J Revelation. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, the prologue and John's greeting. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. With that, uh, speaking of uh, genre, we were, were talking about genres in, in the Revelation. Well, what is a genre? A genre, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is a category of artistic, musical, or literary composition characterized by a particular style, form, or content. In literature, a list of genres would include poetry, biography, mystery, historical narrative, and on and on we could go. To understand what we're reading, if you're reading a mystery, you understand that, that uh, you look at that a little differently than, than a historical narrative. Uh, we would also understand probably a mystery, is, uh, unless it's a historical mystery, would be a, 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 fictional, uh, a fictional book. So we need to know what, a, uh, what genre, or genre we are reading if we were, are going to interpret well what we're reading. We wouldn't interpret a poem or a parable or an allegory the same way that we would interpret a historical narrative. Poetry is very symbolic, uh, but historical narratives are intended to record events in a, in a somewhat chronological fashion. And even in those, we might uh, uh, we might have pause as a as a character in the narrative tells a parable, such as in 
in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus will tell parables. So even within a historical narrative, we might break down into other genres. And we need to be aware of that even as we interpret books uh, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the Revelation really contains three genres. First, uh, the first genre contained in the Revelation is is letter. It's a letter. Well, actually, it, uh, individual letters are given to seven churches in chapters two and three. But uh, as a whole, the Revelation is a letter. We are reading someone else's mail when we read the Revelation. And while it's true that all scripture is profitable for all people of all time, it's also true that this letter, these letters, meant something in particular to whom, to those to whom it, uh, it was written. And if we conclude that the Revelation deals only with events that are almost 2,000 or more years in the future uh, of those to whom it was written to, then we, we have to conclude it didn't mean much to those to whom it was written. Don't we? And that doesn't make much sense to me. If we, if we immediately in chapter four, from the end of chapter three to the, through the first verse of chapter four, we jump more than 2,000 years, or at least 2,000 years, uh, it, it really says that the rest of the book after chapter three doesn't have anything to do to the people, uh, uh, with the people to whom it was written. It wouldn't mean very much. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And that's why, uh, we're approaching the revelation from a preterist perspective. Uh, and while the specific letters are given to us in chapters two and three, I really believe this whole book, of course, should have meaning for those people as well. The Revelation contains the genre letter and uh, or epistle, uh, use whatever word you like, and we need to consider that fact in our understanding of this great book. Secondly, uh, and maybe we, we really only see two uh, genres, but uh, let's break it down into three. The second genre, prophecy. In verse three, it says this the words of this prophecy. Biblical prophecy is very symbolic, and we need to understand it using the key. And the key is the Old Testament usage of similar symbols. Uh, uh, the third genre, and maybe this is really a subcategory of the genre prophecy, is apocalyptic. Now, many scholars believe the Revelation is written in a unique genre described as apocalyptic literature that was popular from 200 B.C. to 100 A.D. And this genre, like I said, seems to be really a subcategory in my mind of the prophetic genre. Uh, it has only been recognized as a unique genre of literature for the last about 50 or 60 years since the discovery of a cache of ancient scrolls in Egypt and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, both of which contained uh, books that are very stylistically like the Revelation. In fact, uh, it, it, it became apparent to scholars as they were reading, as they were uh, translating and reading these uh, documents, many of them which were not books of the Bible, were very similar in style to the Revelation. And therefore, they named this genre after the Revelation, which in the Greek, in Greek is the Apocalypse. So what is the apocalyptic genre like? Well, I gave you a list last week of some uh, technical things that uh, the apocalyptic genre is like, uh, but let's just uh, look at some brief things. First, the apocalyptic genre or ap apocalyptic literature develop as a distinctly Jewish genre. It began with them. It was developed with them, and Christians continued to use it. Also, some scholars have identified what they believe to be the uh, apocalyptic genre in other parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, Daniel's chapter 7 through 12, parts of Isaiah, the last half of Zechariah, and certainly Ezekiel's Valley of the Dry Bones seems seem to be apocalyptic in character. In the New Testament, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, and then 
Second Peter 3 all seem to be written in this apocalyptic genre. Well, what uh, is this like? It, it's extremely uh, symbolic, this genre. And the symbolism is keyed to the Old Testament. But uh, being a Jewish genre, the symbolism is based, of course, on the Old Testament record and Jewish tradition. And a fam familiarity with the Old Testament is necessary to understand the meaning of uh, the meanings. The Revelation is the most Old Testament-like book in the entire New Testament. Dr. Vic Reasoner writes, A working knowledge of the prophetic section of Scripture, Isaiah to Malachi, is a prerequisite for understanding all apocalyptic literature, and especially Revelation. There are 348 quotes and allusions in Revelation to the Old Testament. Sweet said uh, 278 verses of the total 404 verses contain one allusion to the Old Testament passage. William Barclay wrote, he, he was so, uh, wrote of John, he was so soaked in the Old Testament that it was almost impossible for him to write a paragraph without quoting it. Thus Eugene Peterson declared, no one has any business reading the last book uh, who has not read the previous 65. Now to be clear, the Revelation never directly quotes an Old Testament passage. It alludes to Old Testament passages. It assumes that the reader is drenched in the Old Testament and will understand the references. I think this is a, a major reason why there is such, um, um, shall we say, confusion as how to interpret the Revelation because um, I, I think many Christians are, are, are fairly Old Testament illiterate. You really need to be drenched in the Old Testament, especially the minor prophets, if you are to understand uh, the references in the Revelation uh, and uh, really the Old Testament as a whole. So, secondly, ap ap uh, apocalyptic literature uses symbolism to encode the message. Uh, this genre provides a means of encoding the message so that it didn't get into the wrong hands. Uh, during the large part of this time, the period 200 BC through 100 AD, the Jews were conquered and governed by the Romans. Uh, George Eldon Ladd calls it a tract for hard times, the Revelation. Robert Wall wrote the primary purpose of this literature was to reveal the mysteries of God to believers presently experiencing oppression and suffering. So John says, someone with wisdom needs to interpret the meanings. For example, in Revelation 13, 18, John says to identify the beast, this calls for wisdom the identification of the location of the beast, John says, calls for a mind with re wisdom in Revelation 17, 9. In either case, John expected that his readers could figure it out. I won't spoil the story by giving you which city and which person I think best fits these descriptions. That would be like telling you who done it before you read the mystery. Uh, but this very Jewish book gives us the needed clues. The symbolism in apocalyptic literature is also very hyperbolic. Apocalyptic literature often uses exaggerated imagery for localized events. The symbolism used may be of decreation, Images of seeming worldwide and even cosmic destruction, such as stars falling to the earth, the sun being darkened for judgment on a specific city or nation. Now, these images are used to emphasize a local or national judgment from God. It is, after all, really an end to their world. Isaiah 13.1 if we were to go to Isaiah, identifies uh, the judgment that God is going to bring upon uh, in this coming prophecy of chapter 13 of Isaiah on Babylon. 
but listen to the language of Isaiah 13, 10, and 11. Now we could read the whole chapter and you would, you, you would see this apocalyptic flair, but listen to these few verses. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and for and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Now this over-the-top language is not referring to judgment on the entire world. It's referring to judgment on Babylon, according to uh, Isaiah 13.1. But if you read all of Isaiah chapter 13, you will find, uh, find repeated mention of the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord in this chapter is for Babylon. It is the day of the Lord's judgment against that particular nation, against that particular people, against that particular city. And whether we want to describe the revelation as apocalyptic in genre or not, it certainly uses this prophetic hyperbole as a literary method. And uh, I think anyone who reads these, uh, this chapter of Isaiah uh, can see how it sounds like the revelation. Fourthly, some thoughts on symbolic rather than literal interpretation. No matter how much any Bible prophecy teacher uh, proclaims it, no one interprets the revelation literally. I, I hate to use the word literally, it's being misused. Uh, no one interprets the revelation physically or actually. Now, again, I hesitate to use the term literal to describe a means of interpretation that understanding things, uh, that uh, understanding things just as it is written in a physical or actual sense means literal. Uh, actually, to interpret something literally really means to interpret it according to its genre, according to the genre or the style of its literature. Uh, if we understand that a large part of the revelation is prophetic or apocalyptic, we also understand we must interpret it according to that form of literature. That form of literature is very, very symbolic. But let, uh, let me say, no one, no one, no matter how they claim to, interprets the revelation physically or actually, no matter what they say. It's impossible to interpret the revelation just as it is written in physical or actual terms, as if it was a historical narrative. To do so, you would have to believe some things that uh, just seem ridiculous. I don't know one prophecy teacher that believes uh, uh, that if we saw Jesus in heaven, he would look like a lamb that had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, Revelation 5, 6. I don't know that there's any prophecy teacher that actually believes that. They understand that the symbol of a lamb that has been slain speaks of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross as uh, typified in the Old Testament sacrificial system. And uh, uh, the horns have meaning, the eyes uh, are the seven spirits of God is what the revelation tells us. I don't know any prophecy teacher that, that believes an actual star will fall to the earth according to Revelation 8.10. Uh, of course, uh, consider the size of stars. You know, our star, the sun, is a small star, we're told, by, um, uh, by uh, those who study these things. Uh, it's a small star, but the earth is a speck in comparison in size to the sun. If a star were to fall to the earth, well, it's um, it seems more likely that the earth would fall to the star and uh, that would mean it would mean immediate destruction. No one. Uh, I don't believe anyone actually believes an actual star will fall to the earth. That would mean complete and immediate destruction of everything. There would be nothing past that. And we have a lot past that in Revelation chapter 8. I don't believe there's any prophetic teacher that actually believes an actual beast will rule the earth. They interpret that beast to mean a person. That is symbolism, my friend. Revelation 13. 
I don't believe any prophecy teacher actually believes the devil is an actual dragon. He is a spiritual being. He is typified, symbolized as a dragon in Revelation 13. But that is not literal. That's symbolic. I don't know of any uh, prophecy teacher out there that believes the, that the locusts that swarm out of the bottom, uh, bottomless pit are actually locusts or that, uh, or that they actually are just what they uh, appear to be as John describes them. No, they're interpreted by the futurist as helicopters or some other uh, flying machine. Uh, that's a symbolic interpretation made by someone who claims to be interpreting it as as it is written, Revelation 9.3. I don't believe there's any prophecy teacher that believes that Jesus in heaven actually has a large sword protruding from his mouth, Revelation 1.16. Now we could go on and on with examples. The Revelation's prophecy is written in symbolic language that can be understood by those who know the Old Testament well. It is written that way on purpose. Those that claim to be taking it literally just as it is written, uh, misusing that word, uh, are either self-deceived or being purposely dishonest, and uh, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. The real question is this, which interpretation of, of the symbolism of Revelation fits the biblical information. That's the real question. Uh, will we take the symbolic interpretations given to us by the futurist? Will we take the symbolic interpretations given to us by the historicist, the preterist, or the idealist? Which best fits the story of Scripture? Also, the Revelation itself tells us that it's written in symbolic language. The King James Version uh, actually has a more accurate translation of Revelation 1.1 than the ESV, which I like. Uh, but notice the translation uh, signify in Revelation 1.1 from the King James Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, the Greek word for signified in the King James is semeno. Uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon says this, uh, the meaning is to give a sign, to signify. Everywhere in uh, this Greek word is used in the New Testament, it is used in reference to something that signifies or symbolizes something else. Lang, in his commentary, writes that the verb semeno is indicative of the signs employed, the symbol, symbolic interpretation. Tenney wrote, the term evidently me meant a kind of communication that is neither plain statement nor an attempt at concealment. It is figurative, symbolic, or imaginative. It is intended to convey truth by picture rather than by definition. Even John Wolverd, who is a futurist, defines signified as revelation through symbols. The revelation itself tells us that its method of interpretation for the prophetic portions is meant to be symbolic. And the revelation often interprets the symbols for us. Let me just give one of many examples. And I'm glad that it does interpret some of the symbols for us. One example is Revelation 1.20, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And all through Revelation, we have that many times where we are told the interpretation of the symbols. Well, there are many places we are not, and so we need to understand the Old Testament and be drenched in it when we come to the Revelation to understand its symbolic and uh, its symbolic methodology. So, in conclusion, today we've considered genre in the Revelation. The Revelation is a letter. We're reading someone else's mail. We need to take that into account. It meant something to them. And it must mean something to them if we're interpreting it correctly. The revelation is a prophecy. 
Uh, as we said, as I said, it is apocalyptic literature. That may be a subcategory or another genre, uh, but it, the revelation is, as a result, very, very symbolic, and it is drenched in the Old Testament. So we need to be students of the entire Bible if we are going to understand the revelation correctly. Thank you for another opportunity to share uh, more about this wonderful, fascinating book of the Bible. Uh, we'll get together next time and uh, have one more int uh, introduction before we uh, dig into uh, chapter one in more detail. This is Pastor Pete. Thank you and God bless.